So today the objectives are to review the chain of infection, uh, discuss some common epi terms, and then to talk about uh, basic epidemiology methods. So the chain of infection is basically what we use to describe how um, we go from having an organism to causing an infection. And it has six steps. You start with the causative agent, which is the organism that will cause the infection. You talk about the reservoir, which is where the organism is kind of in its normal state. You talk about the portal of exit. That is how uh, the organism, when it's in, in the reservoir, it's usually um, somewhere kind of internal. So it's how the agent will exit the reservoir. We talk about the mode of transmission, and that's how the agent is transferred to the host. We talk about the portal of entry, and that is how the agent gets inside the host to cause tissue destruction, invasion, infection. And then we also talk about the hosts themselves. There are some characteristics of a host that cause them to be more susceptible to infection. So I'm going to move on to um, basic epi methods. We're going to talk about surveillance and disease monitoring, some basic statistics that we would use, ways to identify clusters or outbreaks, and then some study designs. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about surveillance. Specifically, if you're doing surveillance for infections, this re involves reviewing specific patients, determining, yes, they have an infection, no, they do not. Your most common types are going to be surgical site infections, and then organism-specific infections, so rates of MRSA, rates of VRE. When you do surveillance for an infection, you want to ensure that you use a standard definition. For a lot of things that we're going to do surveillance for, the CDC, National Healthcare Safety Network, has put out standard definitions for us. However, if you're in one of those bad cases where you have potentially a GI outbreak related to the chili cook-off that your staff had, you would want to determine and make up your own standard definition or go somewhere in the literature and find a standard definition by which you review each of those cases. A note about trying to make your own standard definition, that's fine, it's completely appropriate. If you get halfway through reviewing your cases and you want to make a change to your standard definition, you need to go back and review those cases you've already reviewed and make sure they don't, make, they don't meet your new definition. When you're surveilling for infections, it's important also to use a standard process. Ideally, the same person would be doing surveillance for infections. These are most frequently one. seen in infection literature. Here is where we start with disease status. I know that these, these people have, have disease. I know that these people do not have disease. And then I want to go back and look at a ton, usually, of different risk factors to see if any of them are related. In general, for every one of your cases, you'll select three or four people from the at-risk population to serve as controls. You will then, I, get, I said, look at many risk factors. And if you can find one risk factor in higher proportion in the cases than the controls, that's where you start to be able to think there may be a, an association, a causal association between these patients. Cohort studies kind of go from the backwards way. They will start by looking at a different population. Uh, generally, you'll be looking at one risk factor of interest, and you will start with the population split by your risk factor of interest, and then go look and see how many of those people develop disease. Um, cohort studies can be done from a retrospective or prospective uh, uh, way to look at it. So a lot of times if you start with a risk factor and you're looking for a disease, you may have to wait a while for disease to happen. So you can actually um, go to the place where you actually, the time in, when you know there's, whether or not disease has occurred, then you kind of go retrospectively, pick your population with and without the risk factor, and then you can already know what, what percent of those populations are going to have disease? What we have is an orthopedic center has an infected, infected hardware. It's, it's been cultured. They know it's infected. They want to know should they, can they, may they, bring that patient back into their facility for removal. What's your advice on that? Uh, you can do anything you want to, <laughs> frankly. I don't think that there's any rules that say you can't. Um, a lot of orthopedic centers especially try to stay very clean and try to try to keep infections out. We have an orthopedic center, an outpatient orthopedic center tied to our facility and they always send them back to us. But there are, you know, there are plenty of methods, again I'm going to discuss this afternoon, ways to prevent transmission of organisms. So I, I think it can be safely done. 
It's just about the culture of your organization and if they feel that it's worth the risk. Kathleen's right. And to that end, make sure that you have a definitive policy and procedure on that and that all your surgeons would be aware of that. So, for example, if your board decides this isn't something we're going to participate in, everybody needs to know that because what are you going to do when that case shows up? Hopefully you, tif you know, were able to sniff it out during the pre-op calls, but if they've decided not to and, and Dr. Smith wants to bring them in because it's easier for him, you, you guys need to talk about that. So um, it all has to be, everybody needs to be on the same page. But by and large, what I, I see is what Kathleen is recommending is they're not generally done in the ASU.